And so he forgot he didn't own a canoe. In the excitement of riding Harriet, well, anyway, he finished the letter by saying, I'll meet you tomorrow at 5 o'clock. And he said, yours very truly, Stuart Little. Well, now, after Stuart had sealed the letter in the envelope, and he turned to the storekeeper, he says, where can I get a hold of a canoe? Well, right here, said the storekeeper, and he walked around the souvenir counter, and he picked up a little birch bark canoe with the words, Summer Memories, stamped on the side. Now, Stuart examined it closely. Does it leak? He asked. See, here it is. It says Summer Memories. Mm -hmm. This is the canoe that the storekeeper is showing him. Oh, it's a nice canoe, said the storekeeper, bending it gently back into shape with his fingers. It will cost you 75 cents plus a penny tax. Well, Stuart took out his money and paid the man, and then he looked inside the canoe and noticed that there were no paddles. What about paddles, he said, making his voice sound businesslike. The storekeeper hunted around among the souvenirs, but he couldn't seem to find any paddles, so he went over to the ice cream counter, and he came back with two little cardboard spoons, the kind you use for eating ice cream on picnics. There, these will work all right for paddles, he said, and so Stuart, Stuart took the spoons, but he was disgusted with the looks of them. They may work out all right, but I would hate to meet an American Indian while I had one of these things in my hands. And so the storekeeper carried the canoe and the paddles out in front of the store and set them down in the street. And he wondered why this tiny boatman would do, he wondered what this tiny boatman would do next. But Stuart never hesitated. Taking a piece of thread from his pocket, he lashed the paddles to the, uh, the thwarts and he swung the canoe lightly up over his head and he walked off with it calmly as though he were a Canadian guide. He was very proud of his ability with boats and he liked to show off. And so that's the end of that chapter and tomorrow night we'll finish all the rest of the book, okay? Okay. Tomorrow night. I hope he finds Margolo, don't you? Me too. Don't you? Yeah. I hope he finds a Margolo birdie because he wants, but it looks to me like at least Stuart has found a Maybe he's going to have a girlfriend. Do you think he's going to like this Harriet Ames, a little girl? Hmm? I don't know. I mean, he's old enough. He should have a girlfriend because he can drive a car. So he's pretty old, don't you think? He's still just a little kid. Is he still a kid? Yeah, well, maybe he is. I don't know. So. Why do you think we're about to Ten. <laughs> That's right. Here we are, Roman and we're on... Now we're in Chapter 14. Roman numerals are very hard to to learn how to do. It's X, I, 5. You subtract the I from the 5, and it ends up being 14. But this chapter is called An Evening on the River. Now, remember what he did. He got himself a canoe, didn't he? He bought a canoe, and he's using little ice cream spoons for his paddles, and he carried it to the river. So, ready to go again? Okay. It says, when Stuart arrived at his campsite by the river, he was tired and hot, and he put the canoe in the water and was sorry to see that it leaked badly. And the birch bark at the stern was held together by a lacing, and the water came in through the steam. And it was, it was, in a very few seconds, the canoe was half full of water. Uh-oh, we're running out of batteries. Here we are, we have good fresh batteries again, and Stuart has put his canoe in the water, and he found out that it was leaking. And, and like, he went in the half of it. The water happened, and he was swimming there. <laughs> well, it says, darn it, said Stuart, I've been swindled. He had paid 76 cents for a genuine Indian birch bark canoe, only to find that it leaked. Darn, 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 he muttered. And then he bailed out his canoe, and he hauled it up on the beach for repairs. And he knew that he couldn't take Harriet out in a leaky boat. She wouldn't like it if she went out and got wet. So tired though he was, he climbed a spruce tree and found some spruce gum. That's some, like, gooey stuff that's in the tree. And with this, he plugged the seam and stopped the leak. Even so, the canoe turned out to be a cranky little craft. If Stuart had not had plenty of experience on the water, he would have gotten into serious trouble with it. It was a tippy boat, even for a souvenir. And Stuart carried stones from the beach down to the water's edge and ballast the canoe with stones until it floated evenly and steadily. 
and he made a backrest so that Harriet would be able to lean back and trail her fingers in the water if she wished. He also made a pillow by tying one of her, his clean handkerchiefs around some moss. And then he went for a paddle to practice his stroke. Now he was angry that he hadn't had anything better than a paper spoon for a paddle. But he decided that there was nothing he could do about it, and he wondered whether Harriet would notice that his paddle was really just an old wooden ice cream spoon. That's a huge spoon. Yeah, it is, isn't it? But remember, remember, he's only two inches long, so that spoon would only be about this big. How about that big? I don't think so. Well, all that afternoon, Stuart worked on the canoe, adjusting the ballast, filling scams, getting everything ship for the morrow. He could think of nothing else but his date with Harriet, and at supper time he took his axe and he felled a dandelion. Look at this. A dandelion is just a little flower, isn't it? Hmm. But he chopped it down with his little axe, and he opened a can. I don't know. He opened a can of bedeviled ham, and he had a light supper of ham and dandelion milk, because they got that white milk in them, and he drank it. And after supper... He propped himself up against a fern, and he bit off some of the spruce gum for a chew, and he lay down on the bank dreaming and chewing gum, and in his imagination he went over every detail of tomorrow's trip with Harriet. And with his eyes shut, he seemed to see... Oh, he's imagining what this is going to be like. The whole occasion plainly, how she would look when she came down the path to the water and how calm and peaceful the river was going to be at twilight and how graceful the canoe would seem drawn up on the shore. And in imagination he lived every minute of their evening together and they would paddle to a large water lily pond upstream and he would invite Harriet to step out on the pad and sit a while and Stuart planned to wear his swimming trunks under his clothes so that he could dive off the lily pad into the cool water. And he would swim the crawl stroke up and down and all around the lily pad while Harriet watched, admiring his ability as a swimmer. See, he's just dreaming of this, isn't he? Mm. He's just thinking that this is what's going to happen. <clears throat> so now Stuart chewed the spruce gum very rapidly as he thought about this part of the episode. Suddenly, Stuart opened his eyes and sat up. He thought about the letter he had sent, and he wondered whether it had ever been delivered. It, it was an unusually small letter, of course, and might have gone unnoticed in the letter box. This idea filled him with fears and worries, but soon he let his thoughts return to the river. As he lay there, whippoorwill, a whippoorwill began to sing on the opposite shore. Darkness spread over the land, and Stuart dropped off to sleep. Well, the next day dawned cloudy. Stuart had to go up to the village to have his oil changed in his car, so he hid the canoe under some leaves and tied it firmly to a stone and went off on his errand, still thinking about Harriet and wishing it were a nicer day. The sky looked rainy. Now Stuart returned from the village with a headache, but he hoped that he would be better by five o'clock, and he felt rather nervous as he had never taken a girl canoeing before. Do you think she's going to come? Think Harriet will come to the... go on the boat ride with him? Okay. He spent the afternoon lying around camp, trying on different shirts to see which looked best on him, and combing his whiskers. And he would no sooner get a clean shirt on than he would discover that it was wet under his arms from nervous perspiration and he would have to change it for a dry one. And he put on a clean shirt at 2 o'clock, and another at 3 o'clock, and another at a quarter past 4. And this took up most of the afternoon, and at 5 o'clock drew near. Grew, Stuart grew more and more nervous, wondering if she was going to come. Okay, he kept looking at his watch, glancing up the path, combing his hair, talking to himself, fidgeting. The day had turned chilly, and Stuart was almost sure that there was going to be rain, and he couldn't imagine what he would do if it should rain just as Harriet Ames showed up to go canoeing. <clears throat> At last, five o'clock arrived. Stuart heard someone coming down the path. Oh, it was Harriet! She had accepted his invitation, 
and Stuart drew himself down against the stump and tried to strike an easy attitude, as though he were accustomed to taking girls out, and he waited until Harriet was within a few feet of him, and then he got up. Hello there, he said, trying to keep his voice from trembling. Are you Mr. Little? asked Harriet. See, here she is. Mm. And here he is. Yes, said Stuart. It's nice of you to come. Well, it was very good of you to ask me, replied Harriet. She was wearing a white sweater, a tweed skirt, short white wool socks and sneakers, and her hair was tied with a bright-colored handkerchief, and Stuart noticed that she carried a box of peppermints in her hand. I bet she's going to give him one, huh? Mm. Not at all. Glad to do it, said Stuart. I only wish we had better weather. Looks rather sticky, don't you think? And Stuart was trying to make his voice sound as though he had an English accent. Harriet looked at the sky and nodded. Oh, well, she said, if it rains, it rains. Sure, Stuart repeated. Repeated Stuart. If it rains, it rains. My canoe is a short distance up the shore. May I help you over the rough places in the path? Now, Stuart was a courteous mouse by nature, but Harriet said she didn't need any help. She was an active girl and not at all... not at all inclined to stumble or fall. So now Stuart led the way to where he had hidden the canoe, and Harriet followed. But when they reached the spot, Stuart was horrified to discover that the canoe was not there. It had disappeared. Oh, no. Stuart's heart sank. He felt like crying. The canoe was gone, he groaned. Then he began racing wildly up and down the bank, looking everywhere. And Harriet joined the search, and after a while they found the canoe, but it was a mess. Someone had been playing with it. A long piece of heavy string was tied to the end, and the ballast rocks were gone, and the backrest was gone, and the spruce gum had come out of the seam, and mud was all over everything, and one of the paddles was all bent and twisted. It was just a mess. And it looked just the way a birch bark canoe looks after some big boys are finished playing with it. Oh, Stuart was heartbroken. He did not know what to do. So he sat down on a twig and he buried his heads in his hands and he said, Oh, gee. He kept saying, Oh, gee whiz. Well, what's the trouble? asked Harriet. Miss Ames, said Stuart. His voice was trembling. I assure you, I had everything beautifully arranged, everything, and now look. Harriet, was for fixing the canoe and going out on the river anyway, but Stuart couldn't stand the idea. It's no use, he said bitterly. It wouldn't be the same. The same as what? said Harriet. The same as the way it was going to be when I was thinking about it yesterday. I'm afraid a woman can't understand these things. Look at that string. It's tied on so tight I could never get it off. Well, suggested Harriet, couldn't we just let it hang over in the water and trail along after us? Stuart looked at her in despair. Did you ever see an Indian paddling along some quiet, unspoiled river with a great piece of rope dangling astern, he asked. Well, we could pretend we were fishing, said Harriet, who didn't realize that some people are fussy about boats. I don't want to pretend I'm fishing, cried Stuart. Besides, look at that mud, look at it. He was screaming now. Harriet sat down on the twig beside Stuart. She offered him a peppermint, but he shook his head. Well, she said, it's starting to rain, and I guess I'd better be running along if you're not going to take me paddling in your canoe. I didn't see why you have to sit here and sulk. Would you like to come up to my house? After dinner, you could take me to the dance at the country club. It might cheer you up. No, thank you, replied Stuart. I don't know how to dance. Besides, I plan to make an early start in the morning. I'll probably be on the road at daybreak. Are you going to sleep out in this rain, asked, asked Harriet. Certainly, said Stuart. I'll crawl under the canoe. Harriet shrugged her shoulders. Well, she said, goodbye, Mr. Little. Goodbye, Miss Ames, said Stuart. I'm sorry our evening on the river had to end like this. So am I, said Harriet. And she walked away along the wet path towards Tracy's Lane, leaving Stuart alone with his broken dreams and his damaged canoe. He was silly. He should have gone with her. Why don't you think he should have gone with her and taken her to the dance? I do. 
<coughs> well, this is now called chapter 15. And it's called Heading North. <coughs> Stuart slept under the canoe that night, and he awakened at four to find that the rain had stopped and the day would break clear, and already the birds were beginning to stir and make bright sounds in the branches overhead. And Stuart never let a bird pass without looking to see if it was... Margo. Margalo, that's right. And at the edge of town, he found the filling station, and he stopped to take on some gas. Five, please, said Stuart to the attendant, and the man looked at the tiny automobile in amazement. Five what? asked the filling station man. Five drops of gas, said Stuart. But the man shook his head and said that he couldn't sell such a small amount of gas. Why can't you, demanded Stuart. You need the money and I need the gas. Why can't we work something out between us? Well, the filling station man went inside and came back with a medicine dropper. Stuart unscrewed the cap of the tank and the man put in five drops of gasoline. I've never done anything like this before, he said. Better look at the oil, too, said Stuart. And after everything had been checked and the money had been paid, Stuart climbed in, started the engine, and drove out onto the highway. Now the sky was going brighter, and along the river the mists of morning hung in the early light, and the village was still asleep, and Stuart's car purred along smoothly, and Stuart felt refreshed and glad that he was on the move again. And half a mile out of town, the road forked. One road seemed to go off to the west, and the other continued north. Stuart drew up to the side of the northbound road and got out and looked the situation over. To his surprise, he discovered that there was a man sitting in the ditch leaning against the signpost. The man wore spurs on his legs. He also wore a heavy leather bed belt, and Stuart realized that he must be the repairman for the telephone company. Good morning, said Stuart in a friendly voice. The repairman raised one hand to his head in a salute. Stuart sat down in the ditch beside him and breathed deeply of the fresh, sweet air. It's going to be a fine day, he observed. Yes, agreed the repairman. A fine day. I'm looking forward to climbing my poles. He climbs up the poles to fix the telephone, see? Yeah. Well, I wish you fair skies and a tight grip, said Stuart. By the way, do you ever see any birds at the tops of your poles? Oh, yes, I see birds in great number, replied the repairman. Well, if you ever run across a bird named Margalo, said Stuart, I'd appreciate it if you would drop me a line. Here's my card. Well, describe the bird, said the repairman, taking out a pad and pencil. Brown, said Stuart, brown with a streak of yellow on her bosom. Know where she comes from, asked the man. Oh, she comes from fields once tall with wheat, and from pastures deep in fern and thistle, and she comes from vales of meadowsweet, and she loves to whistle. Well, the repairman wrote it all down briefly. Fields, wheat, pastures, fern and thistle, vales, meadowsweet, enjoys whistling. Then he put the pad back in his pocket and tucked Stuart's card away in his wallet. I'll keep my eyes open, he promised. Stuart thanked him. And they sat for a while in silence, and then the man spoke. What direction are you headed? he asked. North, said Stuart. Well, north is nice, said the repairman. I've already enjoyed going north. I've always enjoyed it. Of course, southwest is a fine direction, too. Well, yes, I suppose it is, said Stuart thoughtfully. And then there's east, continued the repairman. I once had an interesting experience on an easterly course. Do you want me to tell you about it? No, no thanks, said Stuart. And the repairman seemed disappointed, but he kept right on talking. But there's something about north, he said. Something that sets it apart from all the other directions. A person who is heading north is not making any mistake, in my opinion. Well, that's the way I see it, said Stuart. I rather expect that from now on I shall be traveling north until the end of my days. Well, worse things than that could happen to a person, said the repairman. Yes, I know, answered Stuart. And so following a broken telephone line north, I have come upon some wonderful places, continued the repairman. Swamps where cedars grow and turtles wait on logs, but not for anything in particular, and fields are bordered by crooked fences, broken by years of standing still, and 
orchards so old that they've forgotten where the farmhouse is. And in the north I have eaten my lunch in pastures rank with ferns and junipers, all, all under fair skies with a wind blowing. And my business has taken me into spruce woods and on winter nights where the snow lay deep and soft, a perfect place for a carnival of rabbits. And I have sat at peace on a freight platform of railway junkins in the north in warm hours and with the warm smells. And I have fresh lakes in the north, undisturbed except by fish and hawk and, of course, by the telephone company, which has to follow its nose. And I know all these places well. And they are a long way from here. Don't forget that. And a person who is looking for something doesn't travel very fast. Well, that's perfectly true, said Stuart. Well, I guess I'd better be going. Thank you for your friendly remarks. Not at all, said the repairman. I hope you find your bird. And so Stuart rose from the ditch, climbed into his car, and started up the road that led toward the north. And the sun was just coming up over the hills on his right. And as he peered ahead into the great land that stretched before him, the way seemed long, but the sky was bright. And he somehow felt that he was headed in the right direction. And he didn't. That's the end of it. The end of the book. It's a blank page. So he's going off to search for Margolo, and we may have to get another Stuart Little book to find out if he ever finds Margolo. They could put more pages in it. I know. We read the whole book. That's a whole thick book, and we enjoyed it, didn't we? Did you like it, Cheyenne? Um, yeah, let's count now. One, two, three, four. Not very much, just a little bit. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, a hundred and one.